Hi, good evening, everyone. I hope you can see and hear me okay. Um, my name is Penny Babahani. I am uh, an Iranian German theater producer, um, and I will be chairing this evening's uh, panel on patriarchy and the climate crisis, uh, which has been co produced um, as part of a series. Uh, between Liverpool Arab Arts Festival and Creative Destruction called Artists Ideas Now. Um, to give you just the smallest introduction to the event, um, so the co-hosts uh, this evening, Liverpool Arab Arts Festival, um, the festival was founded in 1998 and is the UK's longest running um, Arab arts and cultural festival. Um, and this year's festival, which has been running since July, both uh, digitally and also in person in Liverpool, um, is dedicated to the um, complexities of the climate emergency in the Middle East and North Africa region today. Um, and is very much looking at the subject matter from an artist led perspective. Um, I, uh, my kind of involvement with this year's festival has been as the creative producer of 22, uh, which is a creative anthology of rapid responses from um, artists and activists across the Arab League, um, providing conversation starters, uh, kind of openings and entryways um, into the really big, vast, and sometimes kind of um, impossible to grapple with uh, topic that is the impact of the climate crisis on the Middle East um, and North Africa. And so I'm really, really pleased today to be joined by um, three artists who have contributed to the 22 project, who are our panelists. And if all the technology goes well, and um, they should start appearing on your screens uh, once I introduce them. So um, first up, we've got um, Ala Gwisir, who is a um, documentary photographer based in Ireland. Um, I don't know what order you see them in, but next on my screen, I've got Juliana Yazbek, who is an actor, writer, and musical artist. And finally, um, we have Mala Alasakir, who is a visual artist based in Kuwait. Hi, everyone. We've just seen each other, but it's great to see See you again, formally, properly, as part of our conversation. Um, so I guess maybe a good way to start um, might be to just throw some just throw some facts out there. We're not coming today kind of into this talk as climate experts by any means. You know, everyone here is very much an artist and a creative. Um, some of us have been thinking and making work around the climate crisis for some time. For others, this project was the kind of the first entry um, into tackling that subject because, and this is quite astonishing to me, will forever remain astonishing. Some of you have just never been asked. Nobody had ever asked you to think about the climate crisis or respond to the climate crisis. Um, which is surreal because as I'm about to share it's very much a kind of a topic that affects us and our homes um, whether they are places that we currently live in or whether they're places that we have ancestry in so um just to kind of get us rolling a few a few facts about the kind of the climate crisis today in the middle east and north africa region courtesy of the arab center in washington dc so at the current rates that we're going, we are looking at a potential four degree Celsius increase in temperatures in the MENA region by the end of this century. Um, and that is compounding effects that are already being felt. And I think this is a conversation that Maha and I had when we first spoke, but about five years ago, Kuwait recorded the highest temperatures that had ever been recorded in the Eastern Hemisphere. Kuwait and Iraq both were two of the highest temperatures that had ever been recorded in kind of modern history. Um, and so, you know, the global warming is, the region's already quite dry and um, quite warm, but the warming is very much being felt as we speak. And when you put that in the context of a region that is incredibly dependent on food imports, 
that makes things even more even more urgent. Um, according to the kind of the, the papers that were cited by the Arab Center in Washington, DC, more than 50 million people in the region uh, were considered chronically undernourished in 2019. Um, the region is one of the most water stressed in the world. So 70% of the world's water stressed countries are in the MENA region. Um, and that is already factoring in the, uh, the reality that 80% of the water used in the region goes towards agriculture um, for about the 5% of the land that is arable. I was always really terrible at facts and equations, but those numbers are kind of pretty stark. 60% um, of the population in the MENA region, MENA region has little to no easy access to drinkable water. Um, and alongside this, um, five countries uh, in the region also hold more than half of OPEC's crude oil reserves as of 2018. So we're talking about a region in the world that is already being affected by climate crisis very severely, will continue to feel really severe effects, um, but at the same time um, is also incredibly oil dependent. And there is no kind of obvious exit strategy um, for how that might change rapidly at the scale that we need it to. Having said all that, we're not the climate experts here, um, but what we do have is three amazing kind of brilliant artists for whom um, gender and matriarchy and women's roles in society have played a kind of a kind of crucial um, aspect in their work so far, which is why I thought you might all be brilliant contributors to what is essentially a living room conversation. Um, I've had the pleasure of speaking to all three of you individually um, about the climate crisis, about your thoughts on it, and you have all kind of um, contributed beautiful works that um, everyone can see on the Liverpool Airports Festival website. Um, but for, before we go on to the kind of inevitable question of patriarchy and the climate crisis, um, I thought I would just ask one by one, um, what if you recall your kind of first reaction to hearing from me with an invitation from Laf about contributing on the topic of the climate crisis and how you initially thought that fit into your work? Um, even if that response was, I don't really think this fits into my work. I'd be really kind of curious um, to hear on reflection what that was like. Juliana, do you want to kick us off? Um, honestly. I was, can you hear me all right, first of all? Yeah, okay. I just wanted to chat with you and Lala and Maha. <laughs> Honestly, I was like, why has this never happened? Like, I just want to sit down with three other MENA women, also creatives, but also just women with these lived experiences that we've been having for our entire lives, whether that's displacement or in the motherland, like you said, and talk about what we're going through. Honestly, that was it. I was like, I didn't even think that anybody else would watch it or there was going to be an audience. I was like, I want to sit down and chat with these amazing women about this, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely something that has come across, that I've come across a lot in talking to all the kind of brilliant artists we're part of 22. Of. We just, we just never get the space to sit down and talk and figure out how we feel um, and figure out something to say, whether that's you know, really elegantly and backed up by lots of facts and science or actually just really instinctively and intuitively. Um, what, was it like, what was it like for you, Ella, when you got the kind of the question, both about this panel, but also about the project more widely? Because I know we've had some interesting chats about what you might contribute. Well, like when I got your email, I literally went blank. I'll be honest. Um, but I remember so a lot of my work has got to do with human rights and so on. And I remember once I was reading a research about how climate change affects the MENA region women in their human rights. 
Um, like as simple, like most of the people that travel for water because there's no water in their area because of their climate change are women. So like it's something as simple as that that we don't think about it. Um, and I remember reading the research and it said that the women are getting married younger because the male wanted them to be safer and having their own household and everything. So they don't have to do those journeys, especially from one tribe to another. And it's a simple thing that we don't even like think about. Um, even like having electricity in the tents, um, like solar panels instead of actual, like some um, places don't even have electricity. So something like that, like solar panels would change a lot. So that's what I first thought, but I can't do anything around that because I'm not in that area. And especially because of that short uh, amount of time, two weeks was it Penny? I remember. And um, so I started thinking, and then it was me and you having conversations about traditions. And then I started thinking about my grandmother and the past and how like her clothing went on to me, the rest of the grandkids. Um, a lot of my living clothes was moved on from one person to another person to another person until it got to me. So I, I was like thinking the sustainability of the traditional clothes. And that's how my idea came about for the collaboration. So, yeah. It's um, I, I love I love the, the photographs um, you've taken, Ella, in no small part because there is also some Kurdish representation in there, which I'm always massively appreciative for. Um, but yeah, it's so interesting that you kind of in your original research, you picked up on these um, on these realities that women in the region face. Um, I was reading just earlier today about this kind of this idea of like um, ownership versus responsibility for the land. Um, you know, very, very little, I think maybe as little as 5% of the kind of the privately held and owned land in the MENA region is held by women. Um, but women are often responsible for keeping the household going, for going to get the water, for making the most of the food that is available to them for feeding their families. Um, but that work kind of rarely ever gets recognized or factored in those realities. They're, they're very rarely um, acknowledged. Um, what about you, Maha? Um, we also had some really interesting conversations when we first started speaking um, yeah. kind of wondering like where where the climate crisis is around you when it doesn't necessarily always feel present I feel like when, when I when I got here <laughs> email, the first thing I'm so sorry it's really the first thing that came to, to my mind is wow such an amazing festival I was like more focused about who you are but then I kind of like freaked out it's like climate change uh like my work is not about that but through the conversation, I realized that my work is about that. It's just how a word can sound different and how we perceive things based on the media and the way how we see it. But then within the conversation, that's what I'm doing. I am personally a sustainable person. I am into textile. I am rethinking about material and, and the way how we are using things and waste in a way that I don't think in any generation there is this amount of waste, of food, of clothes, of everything. Um, and I was so excited that this conversation came from you guys, because usually these kind of conversations always coming from the West, maybe having, but, but to have this kind of uh, identity, people who I relate to. And I mean, we do have our voice. It's just, there is no one place that put it together. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just, um, I was just looking at the page for the piece that you did about rethinking materials. And it's so, it's so interesting to me that by no design of mine, actually, and um, all the three pieces that you all have contributed um, have kind of some element of um, rethinking and reclaiming and reconsidering heritage. 
and our kind of um uh our physical space around us so um like you said, Maha, you, your thing was about rethinking materials. Ella, you looked at kind of returning traditions and clothes. And Juliana, I love, I love your song because it does not feel like initially, we've talked about this, when you first look at it, you're like, this is, what's this got to do with climate change? Um, but you speak really beautifully um, about um, where actually kind of returning to our roots and um, kind of reclaiming heritage plays into into your works I'd, I mean you can kind of kick us off um tying in this kind of this overarching kind of question of like climate and patriarchy and what it means to be um you know women having these conversations and by kind of telling us a little bit about the story of um of your of your work of your song yeah um I think you know there's so much language around okay so the conversation largely I mean actually most conversations largely around the world are belong to a very small demographic let's just say a very small global demographic and then you've got all these people who are indigenous people of the global majority people like us um, and I think in particular when we talk about women we we are also not white women and that's just shouldn't even be a thing but it completely is and often feminism can be monotone and um yeah i you know so already if you know for example when when you and i penny were having the initial conversations about like like um ella and maha were saying about what would you contribute as an artist as an artist who isn't necessarily or doesn't self-identify as my work is about the climate. Um, ultimately, even if it's just about taking up space and being heard, that is already a step towards liberation and also returning to self. I mean, liberation can be interpreted in so many different ways. And that conversation that's so often taken over by this tiny demographic, there's always this idea of complexity and it's complicated and everything is so complicated and it takes time. And I think it's really not, oh my God, it's honestly the, the answer to the climate crisis is two words, land back. I was like, you know, and indigenous people have been saying this for hundreds of years. How to look after the earth. Can you give it back to us, please? And it really is. And, and once I was like, oh, my God, there's so much of this is tied into the world having been colonized and being colonized because it's not something that just ended. Then it, everything just came together and I realized that you know, this whole journey of like everything from no longer wanting to look white to no longer wanting to sound white to no longer what really internalizing or normalizing the systems that don't belong to us. All of the systems that are destroying the planet are not indigenous systems. They are colonial systems. Um, yeah, it just became so simple. And I understood that there is no equality unless it's global. So, you know, and this obviously includes gender equality, but you can't separate, you know, oh, the climate, climate justice is one thing, but actually women, can you actually like stand in line and wait? Because we just need to sort out this really urgent thing. And then it, it doesn't exist. It's all one struggle. And you either have equality, you either have a beautiful, just, natural, healthy world, or you don't. And that was really at the heart of the song that I contributed that, that you very kindly welcomed and put on your platform, but also just, I think, my work in general. That's really the ethos of it. Yeah. It's um, it was so interesting. When you, when you spoke about time, um, Juliana, my, my brain immediately went to you, Maha, and 
the piece that you've made, which um, I, I think hopefully you remember how excited I was when I first like saw the initial like, are you are you are you one hundred percent sure that's a banana peel? Um, because you know, in your kind of work exploring textiles and materials, um, and you were just playing. You were just the way you told this to me is you were just bored and you were playing and you were trying out different things and you came up with this lovely way of turning what is essentially waste into into a new kind of textile that has potential uses. And um, I just thought about time and the way that so much of your work Maha, is focused on women's place in society, because you look a lot at the kind of the restrictions that society places on women that Juliana kind of so beautifully identified. Those societal restrictions are what's killing the planet. That's what they, they are, the kind of the restrictions that if you look at them on the big scale, um, you um, are contributing to our unsustainable ways. And I, and I was wondering whether um, as you were making um, your contribution um, for, for this project, whether you had have had any, any thoughts about time and what it meant as a, as a woman, as an artist to have time and to have space to create differently and to think differently and whether that kind of sparked any ideas in you? Uh, time is like one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about um, and also the material because um, I'm also experimenting with natural dye and stuff, but it, it was funny that like I was showing you a lot of work and I was telling you about my new way of playing and because like sometimes when you start making art, you start to rethink, overthink everything. And instead of producing work, you just criticize yourself. And uh, it was just like the banana that I eat in the morning and I kept it in the car. And then I start to see the transformation of, of the skin, uh, the skin of like the, the peel of the banana, which is, I see it as a skin that's similar to my skin and how it changed based on the time and how it starts soft and yellow and then start to be very stiff and fragile. And I start to play with that. Every day I eat a banana and I keep it in my studio and then I start to weave. And I started to, like sometimes I would do some stitches and, and just observe and have fun with it. Um, but then I, every day, more and more ideas start to, to, to come. And when I start weaving, it just hit me about the things that we wear every day that we even don't think and don't like consider how this fabric was made. It was a thread. It's just like the way how they bond together. And these simple things that we do every day and we don't think about like what kind of material is that? I remember buying, I love fashion and younger, I was like just buying because I like it or it's look good. And when I decided to switch to sustainability, I realized that there's so many information that even hidden, like it wasn't available to me younger. I didn't hear about these kinds of things. I was like hearing certain messages. And once I start to get excited about that, I was like, okay, I'm damaging the first thing I do when I go to store is just like check the label, check the material, and then think if I really need it or not. So all that also come back to hidden informations and the power of information and the idea that women are like, especially in the Middle East, the Arab women, they're the one who run everything. But at the same time, they are full of fear because there's a lot of restrictions and there's a lot of filter of information going to them. Um, so this kind of conversation, I feel like it's where it's supposed to be, to be surrounded by other Arab women and try to talk about it and show them like the, the empower them in a way um, in understanding uh, how can they, how can they contribute to the like a bigger, uh, the bigger pictures of, of the climate and the, and the universe. Yeah, and absolutely. And that requires time and space. And it's so often the kind of thing that's, that's not granted to us because 
you know, one of the, one of the kind of the hallmarks of patriarchal systems is it's kind of relentless productivity and relentless effectiveness, efficiency, and never just the time to, to sit and to explore and to think and to reconsider, to make different, different choices. And actually the, the choices that women make by nature of kind of the role that they have in society, they, they have a huge impact on, on a kind of a, on a personal, on a personal level, um, less so, less so on a political level, which is why I guess we always hear this kind of refrain of like, imagine if a woman was in charge when that was going on, how differently it might have, it might have played out. Um, thinking about kind of textiles and materials, um, Ala, you got to spend some time with the subjects of your photographs. Um, and you might have just been having a really fun time together, which is also completely, completely legitimate. But I'm wondering whether um, you got to kind of have any conversations or hear any stories about their relationships to the clothing that they were wearing and what they thought kind of when you initially spoke to them about doing a project around kind of climate and sustainability to do with their heritage. At first they were like, so I told them what the project was about and they were like, well, like I was like, I'm picturing um, traditional clothes and it's about climate change. And they were like, how the hell does traditional clothes go with climate change? So the, I, I didn't want to say it to them straight away. Uh, so uh, Shilan and Tibra um, and Rahaf as well, the three of them, the outfits are actually not theirs. It was given down to them as much as like um, Tibra's uh, Libyan outfit was given down from her sister. Shilan's uh, outfit was from her mother, the Kurdish outfit. And then Rahaf's outfit was actually embroidered by her grandmother. So it was a like, I was like, okay, do you not see there's a pattern there? And they were like, oh yeah, there is. And I was like, okay, what are the materials that are used in these um, outfits? The Kurdish one, we didn't know because it was uh, Shilan's mother. Uh, but the Libyan one, we knew it was from silk. Um, and it was even the thread is from gold and everything. So all these are eco-friendly. Um, and then the Palestinian was as well. It was, uh, I, I can't remember from the top of my head, but it was a material sourced from locally in Palestine. So I was like, this, these are like the small things that we take for granted and we don't think of. Um, and that's how I kind of came back to the title of returning to a to returning to traditions because if we think of it our traditional heritage was all made and locally sourced so nothing was coming from the outside and it was all eco-friendly and it was um like if it if you had to bury it um it will dissolve um the other thing is about living clothes um it's not only something that comes with you um, from your hair like from who, whoever wore it beforehand like my grandmother it was my auntie that gave me mine but I have my grandmother's and um, you get it from some people get it before they get married and then some people get it when they get married there's a certain outfit each outfit has a different meaning to it but the one you get married in is also what covers you before you get buried so it they live for such a long a time. My grandmother got married in the 30s and she passed away in 2007. So you can imagine how, how old her outfit was. Um, and that's how, that's, yeah, that's the conversations we're having. That's, that's amazing to think there was such a kind of a contrast between, you know, what you were talking about, Maha, like the clothing that you used to wear and most of us still wear um, because that's what's available to us versus how, how it was done before. Um, and since you were kind of talking about roots and heritage, Ella, it, it made me think um, one of the other pieces um, that's been contributed to 22 Project um, uh, by an artist called Nadia Boyce uh, called How to Die slash DIY. And you should see it. It's very cool. But um, something that she she wrote for the project that really, really struck me. And I kind of want to read it out to you and see um, 
what you make of it is around this kind of this um, uh, the struggle that we have between um, you know these ideas of what sustainability means of living locally of local of acting locally etc whilst having um, displacement and movement and migration as part of our heritage um, so Nadia Nadia wrote um, how do we express that we the people of the global majority are intimidated by the unbearable whiteness of green um, which is a quote that you can kind of read more about. It's linked in the piece, which thinks locally and doesn't speak for the native homes destroyed by colonial enterprise, war and oppression. Um, and that really, when I first read that, that sent like a, like a shudder down my spine because, um, you know, when I, when I kind of started to think about what a more environmental friendly existence for me looked like, personally it was very much about trying to live and exist and contribute as locally as possible make it grassroots you know like where I can go to the local butchers and the fishmongers and the fruit and veg vendors avoid supermarkets try and eat out and go to the cinema everywhere that's within walking distance try and live within this kind of concept that's becoming very fashionable um, of like a 15 minute city where this idea is that like the perfect kind of sustainable existence is one where you can get to everything that you need, get to work, get to education, get to kind of amenities within a 15 minute walk or bike ride. Um, but there was always this kind of like this, this weirdness in me um, around home and family and the people that every once in a while I get on a really like carbon intensive flight to go visit because they're such an important part of who I am. And so when I read this, this beautiful thing that Nadia wrote, which thinks locally and doesn't speak for the native homes destroyed by colonial enterprise, war and oppression. I just, it was such a beautiful kind of expression of not necessarily a solution, um, but this question of like, how do we, how do we do it? Um, how do we kind of hold our heritage and express it and stay connected to it um, while, while trying to kind of enact change on a local, local level? I don't know, I'll kind of throw it, throw it, throw it open for anybody who might have any kind of reactions or thoughts to that. It is so loud that the same cultures that destroyed community are now waking up to community. It's just, I will only use the word loud. I'm not even going to give an opinion. I don't need to, but it is loud. And there is so much work that needs to be done outside of communities that have been stripped of their, their natural way of life. So much work that needs to be done. Um, it is beautiful that we're even asking this question amongst ourselves. I still think the, the really the, the core work is, <laughs> sis, like, would I even be here if I could? If I could, I would be in my grandma's village eating za'atar, okay? That, like, do I even want to be in this city? Um, yeah, you asked, you asked for my thoughts. <laughs> like, here they are. But, yeah, it's, um, it's really loud. And it's also, you know, there's this, like, cycle of... There's a lot of finger pointing towards glo global south, for lack of better words, awful term, and indigenous peoples, and like your practices are barbaric, and like you are the largest producers of waste and pollution. Again, it's really, really loud. Like some indigenous communities literally cannot survive without um, traditional hunting practices. Other communities cannot survive without fast fashion and cheap production and you know things that aren't serving anyone least of all them and we all know why 
we know why. We know why being an eco-conscious person is now an expensive practice. That is so against nature. And I really think that's where the work needs to start. I don't know, like if any white people are watching this, like just look in the mirror and start there. Thank you. I think talking about being um, eco-conscious, I feel like it's so much easier to be eco-conscious in our countries than here. Um, like when Joel, Joanna, uh, Joa, uh, I can never say your name. Uh, me. Jo- 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 you can call me Jewel. Yeah. Jewel. Khalas. Um, <laughs> it's because I'm dyslexic, guys. So I apologize. I look at the name and I can't read it. It's totally all right, Allah. <laughs> um, like she was talking about her grandmother's house and everything. And all it hits me is me walking around my grandmother's house and it's all pomegranate and olive trees and peach tree and date tree, like a, a nakhl, like a, I forgot what a nakhla is in Arabic. Oh, palm tree is a palm tree. Palm nakhla, tree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so on. And it's like, we get our fruit from just, just walking my back garden. Even, um, like it's so much la- like you're walking on l- acres of land just all planted um it just and then I come over here and I have to buy everything everything is packaged in plastic everything is fast fashion and it's interesting like it's the west that is causing the effects on the on the MENA region and the rest of the world and um, but they're not aware of it it's just oh the weather is getting colder over here because of climate change, but what are the effects that you're doing back in other countries that you're not even aware of? It's so, it's so, it's so, um, uh, I don't know whether it was you, Maha, who was, when we were talking, said, you know, like, I go to the supermarket now and everything that my, mo- or that your mother buys, everything is wrapped in plastic. And that's so fascinating to me because of this, um, this research that I that I mentioned at the beginning um, about how actually the MENA region has become so dependent on food imports now. And along with those foods being imported, they're also importing the plastic and the lifestyle and the packaging that comes with it, right? I don't know what what, what is it what is it like now in like Kuwait because yeah I just had this really vivid memory of you talking about your mother. Yeah, we're talking, I was talking about how I like when I came when I came back from the states and I mean where I already established my way of like sustainable and and you know not buy things unless I need it and living in really really with minimum stuff although there are a lot but there are also minimum coming back home, seeing everything wrapped in plastic. Like even the food, if they want to bring it from the outside kitchen inside, everything with plastic, it was like, mom. And she's like, no, like just like for the flies, like it's okay, you can just cover it. Like this is a plastic, this is a waste. And my mom is very, like my mom is like, uh, she's well-educated, she is, you know, she knows everything. But these kind of small information that they don't think about and how each home contributes like like thousands of plastic wraps every day and and it's it's fascinating how these small mundane everyday life things that we do like plastic bottles uh clothes that we buy and throw like these are small little things that we are not aware of it because we are doing it every day and we we'll just get used to it. That's that's where the shift is. The shifts start here. And I know and another note, I just I was thinking about what Allah said about the uh, the traditional outfits and how back then uh, you know people who are sustainable are like like really small villages, poor, less educated people. And now, and now to be sustainable, you need to be, uh, you need to have money because it's expensive to be sustainable. And that's, it's like really fascinating me how the idea of being sustainable and, and think of the materials is, is really costly. And it's start to be like an elite or like a trend that only people who, who has, 
uh, uh, more advantage like money wise to to do it and, and and this kind of new society that complicated things and now want things to keep back to basic but it's expensive yeah, it's, I find that so fascinating that you started your journey towards sustainability while you were still in the States and then you come back home to Kuwait and everything's wrapped in plastic and plastic is indigenous to nobody. <laughs> so somebody <laughs> kind of, you know, imported that lifestyle, but also that mentality and kind of that societal acceptance in our families and our mothers, this idea of like what constitutes clean and respectable is now everything that is like, wrapped to the nth degree and plastic and covering um and yeah I don't know it's it's so it's it's so strange kind of um having having those conversations with my mother um because I feel like there's this like this this lopsided generational thing where if I look back at my grandmother's generation she had no choice but like you said Maha to be sustainable that was just the way her life was there was no plastic back then there was we we bought everything in bulk my um my mother came to visit me recently and I very proudly took her to a zero waste store in my neighborhood and I was like yeah so here's what I do I bring my I bring my little like canisters and I go and I pull on the fancy lever and it dispenses like lentils into it and she goes yeah that's what they also do back home in the bazaars and it, it it, it, I just kind of sat there and I was like oh yeah oh yeah that thing that I after we kind of emigrated and left started to look down as like oh that's a weird thing that's a bit of like a weird backwards thing right that like people just go to like the bazaars and they have and they just like scoop out whatever they want into a bag and take it home that's weird everything comes should come in nicely packaged kind of like boxes and then now I'm actually going no 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 get rid of the packaging go back to the scoop egg and my mom just finds it so hilarious <laughs> because she's like you didn't like it you didn't like it when it was some the thing that my grandmother did but because now it was shame no because we yeah. experienced racism for being sustainable absolutely because, yeah. and so now that she's learned to do things the western way the acceptable way I'm turning back around to her and saying, actually, no, you shouldn't do that. Um, but yeah, it, that was just a that was just a very like humbling moment that I had last week with my mother in my fancy North London zero waste store. <laughs> Penny, do you remember the conversation that me and you had about when our parents first migrated and how they used to sew our clothes and everything? because life was so expensive here. So they had to think of the most basic things. Like a lot of my friends, my dad was here way before I was born. So I never experienced this. My dad was already here for 15 years. But I have a lot of my friends that their parents used to sew their aid clothes, um, their school clothes, and so on. And oddly enough, now they all buy their clothes because it's like more kind of prestige and everything. But it's, my friend would never say, oh, my mom sold my clothes or something like that. And because my parents never did it, I used to be like, why is uh, like this person selling their clothes? Or why is this mother selling their clothes? Why does my mom not know how to sew? And it's something that I felt like I wanted, but they didn't want. Um, and I, But it was interesting, like, we were sustainable even when we came. It's just we had to go with the wave and, like, westernize ourselves. Yeah, that idea of prestige, we had to we had to buy our way into social acceptance, right? We had to buy our way into being presentable and acceptable and what's the word that I'm looking for that isn't coming to my brain? Integrated. We had to like inter buy our way into being like socially cohesive and integrated. And all of a sudden everyone's going, actually, buying is bad. But we've decided buying is bad. So now it's really bad. <laughs> Uh, funny enough I was watching everyone probably knows the five guys and there was uh, the Korean guy I think he's Korean I can't remember his name but he was saying about when his family first moved from Korea and for his it's it's funny how clothing is now going into sorry it's off topic but I just remembered his mom would go to charity shops and buy like things that are branded so they can face like the kid, her kids will face less racism in school 
and for them to not get that much racism and I was like that's something like I would have never thought he was in a white school and everything but even our clothing um, made the statement of where we come from and so on yeah who we are where we've come from and how yeah how integrated we are and how acceptable we are did I just cut somebody off I wasn't sure was it was it you Maha no, no, I'm fine. No, I'm just like, I, I just felt very um, sad. That's it. Like the thoughts of buying the, the like label brand so her, her kids would be having less bullying. Um, we have about kind of 10, 15 minutes left. And so I actually wanted to open up to the rest of you. Are, are there any kind of questions that you want to ask of each other or anything that, you know, you want to, you kind of want to, want to, want to squeeze into these last kind of 10 minutes of conversation. Otherwise I will, I will have questions, but I thought I could stop asking the questions for a minute and see if any of you on the panel wanted to ask each other questions. I have one question that I always find hard to answer. How do I, we make our careers sustainable, like climate friendly? Because a lot of us use electricity, petrol, so on. That What decisions do we make when we make work? Hmm. I never thought of that in this way. Um, I feel it's it starts with the, the way how you live your life, like the way the decision that you do every day, the things that you eliminate and live with it. And through that, your art would be coming from there. So it's, it's mostly about your daily habits and choices that you make. Because once you live in that, um, environment, your art will be more uh, within the, the, these rules. What about you, Juliana? Mm, such a good question. Um, I do know that the system I am sort of required to survive makes it impossible for me to truly, 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 truly live within the, I don't even want to say ethics because I don't think they're ethics for us. They're just the way of life. It's almost a spiritual thing, you know, looking after the, the land. It's that simple and, af and after each other and, and living for the community. I know that the system I live in now makes that impossible. And like we just said, and like Maha just said, if you're not really wealthy you can't really make those decisions of being like oh I'm going to live off grid in the middle of nowhere it's it's a bit mad that you have to be rich to do that um so it's just something that I carry with me does it make me furious and sad yes um but I feel like there is hope in truth so just being true and being like do you know what this is not my system it's not our system it shouldn't exist I don't want it and from there I can I can start to be like well then how do I live outside of it how do we all live outside of it you know what needs to be dismantled and like Maha said some of it is going to literally be mundane stuff other is going to be systemic stuff but they are interconnected and the other which is the more creative aspect is that I kind of naturally so before lockdown, sort of early 2020 was when my career kind of rocketed. As far as the industry is concerned, this means numbers and money and magazine covers and that kind of stuff. It has nothing to do with art. It's just, you know, what the industry considers to be successful. And I remember feeling really out, like not in alignment with myself. The more I kind of like went on tour and I don't know, like played these big venues, like massive lighting and thousands of people. It, it just felt so, I don't know, un inauthentic. I'm not saying I wouldn't like to have a big career, but 
if I didn't live in the system, is that what I would really want? And I think the answer is no. I think the answer is I would want to use my voice, probably in a garden or a forest with a community, probably our community. It literally, if I didn't live in capitalism, that's, that's what I would want as a human being, as an artist. Um, and I just hold on to those two things and try to stay true to them. But it is, I mean, the rage of knowing that, yeah, I have to, I have to live in this system that's not mine and it wasn't made for me. And it's kind of pretty much made to destroy us. But here we are trying to like hustle and thrive. You know, there is rage there. Maybe we can use the rage and do something with that. Yeah, and I always, um, the thing that I love about kind of being in, being in community with um, artists who do kind of come from, uh, in, this, in the case of the UK, kind of deliberately marginalized backgrounds is that actually, um, they don't always refer to it as sustainability, but the way they look at kind of sustainability um, isn't so straightforward, isn't so cut and dry. Um, so when I kind of look at projects, I try to think, I try and break down the sustainability of it into three possible strands. Um, that could be the environmental sustainability, the, the literal kind of day-to-day -day material impact of a project. Um, but it could also be the social sustainability of it, um, who it serves, who it works with, who it creates a community for, what kind of like grassroots infrastructure it helps to either build or develop upscale. Um, and then there's also the kind of the economic aspect of sustainability as well. One of my favorite topics of um, research is this idea of a care economy, of uh, this kind of referred to as a feminist Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is this kind of idea that lots of governments, progressive kind of um, people are trying to push for governments to implement of uh, kind of overhauling the economic system around renewable energy, et cetera. Um, and there's a faction who are pushing for a feminist Green New Deal that is based in care, that is based in paying teachers more, paying nurses more, paying social workers and um, care home workers and um, people who work in daycares are kind of the people really actually valuing those jobs and those roles <clears throat> and um, artists. So that actually um, the kind of the, 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 the labor of these people is recognized and compensated and the kind of the thinking behind that goes that if we invest more money in looking after each other as opposed to just buying stuff and um, we will inherently live more sustainable lives so that's kind of what I try to what I try to look at whenever I look at a project I'm like you know realistically like Juliana said it's the, the system that we live in it doesn't allow perfection um, it doesn't allow us to fully live by our values um, because it's always trying to exploit labor out of us. Um, but maybe, maybe kind of you can hit two out of three pillars. Maybe you can hit one of those kind of three pillars of looking at sustainably in a more um, holistic way, whether it is the environmental impact or it's the social impact or it's the economic impact that you have. Um, there's always room to do better in one of those and kind of gradually and maybe that will help that will help the other aspects as well um but yeah i recently did a i produced a play where when we look at the budget breakdown we had spent far more money on people than we had on the physical stuff because the people we looked out for each other and supported each other and kind of helped us. To, we weren't, we were by no means perfect, but they helped us towards making the process feel more sustainable. And the stuff we actually, um, we got from people who were going to throw it away 
and then we gave it away to people instead of throwing it away. And the aesthetics of it are different. It doesn't look like the kind of the flashy Western shows that you're used to with everything brand new. It looks and feels very different, but that was our, that was our attempt. Um, and I think attempts are important. Attempts like the kind of the beautiful works that you all have created or, or contributed to 22 are important because they show possibilities, right? They show us kind of opportunities to think differently and do differently. Um, and yeah, the thing that I think I've said to all of you and everyone who has been a part of this project is maybe one of the 22 pieces that we have online will speak to you and make you, and lead you to starting a conversation that you wouldn't have otherwise had, lead you to make a change that you would otherwise wouldn't have made. Um, and that's a, that's a start. That is absolutely a start. Um, I think we are very much at time now. I don't think we do have time for any other questions. Um, but thank you all so much for joining me this evening um, in my literal living room for what's been a really fabulous um, conversation. I wish we could have had it in person, but I'm really glad that the wonders of Zoom actually allows us to connect across countries and cultures and time zones. Thank you for being us so late, Maha. Really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm very grateful to meet amazing two artists. Um, it's always for me, it's, I get excited when I see another creative and try to learn and understand what they're seeing, what they want to say. Uh, so, I'm enjoying the 22 artists too, just going through your website, whatever I have like spare time to see the work, uh, try to understand the person and their voice. Everybody there is really inspiring. Thank you all so, so much. I think Thank the you. way this works now is gonna, we turn our cameras oh. off. <laughs> I was just gonna echo what Maha said that honestly, this was really special. Um, you know, when we talk about doing the work, thank you, Liverpool Arab Arts Festival, for literally doing the work and claiming these spaces. Nobody's going to offer them to us. So here we are making making space and time. And Allah and Maha, like, honestly, this has been such a pleasure to kind of see a bit of the insides of your creative minds and wonderful spirits. Yeah, thank you, guys. I'm the same. Um, and honestly, seeing other Arab artists kind of empowers me as well. Um, sometimes I feel, especially in Ireland, we don't have that much Arab artists. There's only about four of us. Um, and I was the first to graduate from art school and actually get an award from the thing. So it feels like I'm really alo alone when it comes to Ireland um, in the arts field. But seeing other Arab artists kind of empowers me. And I'm so happy to have a conversation with all of you. And hopefully there's many more to have and maybe one day face to face in Liverpool. Thank you all so much. Have a um, lovely evening and thank you thank for you. joining us and watching from wherever you are. We're going to disappear from your Zoom screens now. <laughs>